the lecture of EP 4165, Computational Heat and Fluid Flow. So we have come now to chapter 5, finite volume method for one-dimensional scalar conservation balls. And uh, last lecture we saw about uh, the Riemann problem. So the Riemann problem for the scalar one-dimensional conservation law we can express in the following way. We have our scalar conservation law. That was what we had in the beginning. That was our <coughs> equation in two. We have, um, we write it now in this mathematical notation, the u dt in this form. And u is a conserved variable. It's a scalar. And we have a flux function which depends on that scalar. And we take the derivative of this flux function that depends on u. And on the right hand side we have zero. So we have this um, scalar one dimensional conservation law with a special initial condition. And that is with the following initial condition. This is the acronym for initial condition. And that was what we had with nine that we said the uh, u, that is our concept variables, at the time equal to zero, is defined by ul, the constant, if x is smaller than zero, and by ur, if x is larger than zero. So, and that <coughs> constitutes, constitutes the Riemann problem. So it's... Uh, an initial value problem. We have uh, a piecewise constant initial condition for the one-dimensional scalar conservation law. And last time we already looked at the two possibilities. Either UL is larger than UR, then we get a shock. Or we have UL smaller than UR, then we get a rarefaction wave. So we shall look at that now in more detail, and to start we look at an animation of a numerical simulation of this. So let's see what happens. So first I have to explain to you what, what, we, are, what we see here. That is, uh, let's see if I can find the pointer, anybody seeing the pointer? I don't see that at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so we have <coughs> this continuity is at one half, and uh, there we have uh, to the right we have two, and to the left we have eight, and we assume periodic boundary conditions. That is, when we continue, then to the left of this we will have uh, again two. So, what can we now expect? We have at this location, 0.5, we have u left is 8 and u right is 2. So, there we can expect a shock. On the left, we have uh, to the right, we have 8. And what you don't see, but we will see it later, we have 2 on the left. So, there u l is smaller than u right. So, at that point, we expect <coughs> to get a rarefaction wave. So now we let the thing go and see what happens. And indeed, the shock is moving to the right, and there is a rarefaction uh, wave establishing where the velocity goes from 2 to 8. It should be linear, but we have some numerical errors, of course, because we have a, an approximation. But nevertheless, you see the structure. And the shock is then uh, ending at, at 1, but you see it already starting here because we have assumed periodic boundary conditions. Yes? Uh, is that kind of a oblique shock? Or Sorry? That uh, line, that straight line, is that a kind of a oblique shock? Or no, it's it not a oblique shock. It's completely, completely different. It's, something different. it's completely different. It's continuous and it has a completely different structure. So the shock is a discontinuity and the rarefaction wave is uh, continuous. It is only the, at the ends so up here it is smooth, that is a numerical error, but it should be sharp. So the, there it is not differentiable, these points, this point and this point, but it is smooth. So it's completely different from a shock. 
So, now we want to understand this a little bit in more detail, and then we discuss the two options, and then we'll see how, this, uh, how we can establish really the exact solution to that. So, we look now for the inviscid Burgers equation. That is our favorite example of the 1D scalar conservation law. And that is, as we saw, ut, that was the equation 4, ut plus, and our flux function is u squared half. So our, that means our f of u is u squared half. So, and for that we look for the Riemann problem. So we look now and we see the different uh, options. So then we look for the example one, and that is, that is the example when we get a shock. And that is when we have the UL is larger than the UR. So we are now solving the implicit Burgess equation with this initial <coughs> condition. So we are solving the Riemann problem for the implicit Burgess equation. <coughs> so what happens here? First we draw our initial condition, and then we shall also draw the characteristics. So here we have our initial condition, that is u of x0, our initial condition. We assume that we are on the left larger, so that is u left, larger than on the right. So we assume that we have here the origin. So that corresponds to the initial condition here that we had in the beginning at 0 0.5. So, and then we look at the characteristics and they will then tell us what is happening. <coughs> so we have x and here we have the, the time. Now, what are the characteristics? The characteristics are the curves that are defined, the curves x of t, defined by the slope. And the slope, this is given by, in that case, u itself. So that means on the left, we will have the u left. So let us try to see what this will look like, roughly. So let us assume that we have maybe something like that. And here, here you should be a little bit careful because we have, uh, we have we get some conflict there but this will then be so you can understand uh, how to plot it if we go a certain time t then the flow will have traveled u times t u l times t is then longer than u r so u r so the characteristics that we plot on the right hand side they will have the slope <coughs> and they will then maybe look like this. Let's see if I get that. So we should not get them too far because we, we, we shall get a conflict with these characteristics. So they will be all parallel. But you see the conflict will be here when we continue this. We will at some point they will cross. That cannot happen. Because then we would have... Uh, solutions that have uh, two or three values or whatever, so we must have a solution to that. And the solution to that is that nature puts a shock at that location, and the shock has actually a, a slope that is, happens to be the average of these two. So let's try to see if we get this. Is maybe something like that. So then, we don't get into, we get into the shock. So we end, the characteristics will end in the shock. Also the characteristics that here, that they will end in the shock. And these, uh, the shock speed that we have then, that is then uh, given by the average of the two uh, velocities u l and u y. I just write here. So the dx, I call it s, that is for the shock of t, that is the characteristic for the shock, that is equal to s. We shall 
see that this S is the average. So what does that mean now? If we look at a certain time t, let's see if we take, for example, this time as the t, that will be our time t, then we, can, we uh, know that the solution at uh, this point here, for example, that will be given, you can trace it back to the initial condition, it will be given by u left. If we are on the right hand side of the shock, <coughs> here, we can trace that back, we get to u right. So then the, the easiest is that we identify the location of the shock, that is then if we go up here, so the shock will then have moved up to here. So that will be then the shock. And to the left of the shock, we will then have the solution from u left, and to the right, we will have u right. Let's see if I find the color. You can see the, the blue. Just tell me. Can you see the blue? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, and then, so that would be then the solution including the shock, that would be the solution that we have at x t, at this time t that we selected here. And on the left, you see here, if we are on the left of the shock, we have the u left, and on the right, we have the u right. So that is then the solution. And we can write it in a closed form. And um, here I forgot to indicate the origin, so that this is the origin here. So we can write that in a closed form. <coughs> so the solution to this Riemann problem, when we have u l larger than u r, is then the following: so that's ten, and say then that the u of x t is equal to. And now we must identify this location. So we start from zero and this location here, but we can understand that. So the, the slope here of the characteristic is S. That is the shock speed. So that means the shock has traveled the distance S times T. So this location here is S times T. So that means to the left of ST, we'll have U left, and to the right, U right. So that is then the solution that we have that we have u left for x smaller than st and we have u right for x larger than st. So there we have the solution if we have a shock. And the shock speed, we shall give a reason for that uh, in a minute. The shock speed that is uh, s and then, as I already said, the average of u uh, left and u right. So the arithmetic average. That is called the shock speed. So that completes the solution for a shock. And if you'll see here what has happened. Um, let's see, we had uh, in this example that I showed you from the animation, we had the time was 0 0.1 and the u left, that was, remember the shock was initially at 0.5, 8 to the left, 2 to the right, so the average is 8 plus 2 divided by 2 is 5. So it is traveling then with a shock speed of 5 times 0 0.1 that gives us the distance the shock has traveled in the time 0 0.1 and that is 0 0.5. And you see where it is, it is exactly, it has traveled from 0 0.5 to 1. So that is good. So now we have then seen the shock. Now we want to see the other option that we have when u l is smaller than u right. We still consider the Riemann problem for the implicit purpose. So that's then our example two. And that gives 
what is called a rarefaction wave. The names that are used here are taken from gas dynamics, where we have uh, shocks, where the density, temperature, velocity, all flow variables change drastically, where the uh, temperature, density, pressure are drastically increased, and the normal velocity is drastically reduced. So, and these names are just taken from gas dynamics and used here for this scalar equation, which is a model equation. So therefore, this rarefaction wave uh, means that, um, that uh, it gets, uh, the gas gets more rarefied, more thin, that the density gets lower. That's what it, what it comes from. But what we <coughs> get, that is this uh, smooth distribution that we see here, that is that line indicates the rarefaction wave. So UL is smaller than U right. So let us then again try to understand this by looking at the characteristics, at the initial condition, the solution, and then see what, what we get. <coughs> so here we have first again the initial condition, and we do it just the opposite. We have now u left is small, smaller than u right. Just the opposite to what we considered before. And then again the characteristics, the origin is again here. The characteristics tell us then what is happening. And that is then t. And uh, well, what is happening? We can again write down the characteristics. And the characteristics, they will have then the slope dx of t dt. On the left, it will be ul. And that will be, be now <coughs> slopes that are not that, uh, 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 so small slopes. And we can maybe write them in this form. It should be parallel. And so on. So that should be then on the left. And on the right, we will have then slopes that are determined by the value on the right, which is then larger. So if we write the characteristics on the right, then they will be, maybe look like that. So they will maybe have this slope. They are all parallel. But what is happening in between? It turns out that in between we have a linear distribution of the solution and then we have a linear change of the slopes. So it turns out that we have straight lines which look like that. So and the end lines are then uh, with the slope u right and the slope u left. <coughs> So again, we can check then the solution at uh, certain, certain times. And if we do that, for example, if we choose a time, let's see, choose a time here. So that is now our time t that we choose, this particular time. Then again, we have the origin here. Then we can identify the distance that the flow has traveled in the time t. And the distance is then uh, for, for this characteristic with the slope <coughs> left, that is the distance is then ul times t. And if we go to the diagram up, we will then see that we get in here. So the distance here, that is then ul times t, this distance here. So that means the characteristic has traveled then, the solution actually, the solution has traveled then up to this point. So we start here, has traveled to this point. And on the right hand side, if we look for this characteristic, that is the first characteristic that has the slope u right, we can go up and then we see 
this point then has traveled to this point. It has traveled the distance u right times t. So the distance that we have here is then the u right times t. u right times t. And that means the solution from that point on will have u right. So that will be then the solution there. And in between, we have simply a linear distribution. If it would go in between, it just goes linear from, from UL to U right. So we get this distribution. And that is what you see here on the animation. The difference is that in the animation, a numerical solution is used, so we get numerical errors. You see the smooth where the error is, that is at this point here, we get a smoothing, which is a numerical error. In fact, we should have a discontinuity in the first derivative here. Here the slope is zero, and here the slope is given by the, the u right minus u left times divided by this distance. And also here we have a sharp edge. So that is the solution then for the rarefaction wave. And the name is then coming from the flow, uh, the density getting thinner. So if you imagine this, uh, the u would be density, then from a high density, it gets to a low density here. So that is called rarefaction wave, and the solution to this rarefaction wave, we can also write in closed form, and then we get the following. So the solution to this problem, that is for the Riemann problem, for the the uh, inviscid Burgess equation with u l smaller than u right is the following <coughs> 11 that is our in that case it is u the velocity for the Burgess equation is then given by now we can here see what we have to choose to the left of u l times t it is u l to the right of u r times t it is u r and in between it is linear it turns out that it is, uh, and we can get a simple form for that. So it is u l for x smaller than u l t, and it, the, in between it is actually x divided by t. So we can simply take this ratio when we are between u l t and u r t. So then we get this. And if we are to the right of the x uh, larger than u r <coughs> t, then we get the u r. So that is then the solution for the rarefaction wave. <coughs> One can prove that, but we uh, do not do that here. That is part actually of a PhD course that I'm teaching that right now numerical methods for hyperbolic problems in fluid dynamics. So there we do the proof of that. But let us uh, think a little bit about that. So this is the solution, but um, what uh, couldn't we have also another solution? Because this is, uh, makes sense and we get a closed form solution, and it's actually the right one, but um, couldn't we have also a solution of the following kind? That we have x and uh, we have u, we have ul, we have u right. That we had a solution where we get a shock. Couldn't, could that be? So could that be a solution? That we have maybe something like that. It turns out the answer is no, because it turns out that this, that would be an expansion shock. But that is wrong. If you look for the characteristics, then we could not follow the characteristic to the initial condition. And if we would perturb this solution a little bit by introduce the viscous terms in the uh, inviscid Burgess equation giving us the true Burgess equation and let the viscosity go to zero, we wouldn't get this solution but we would get this solution.
So this is not a stable one, it is not physical, and it is actually violating a property that is called Lux entropy condition. So and that is where we can check whether that is a shock or whether it is a, not a shock. So we can then just state that the expansion shock, which is unphysical, would violate the Lux entropy condition. So that is look what the Lux entropy condition says. Again, the name is also taken <coughs> from gas dynamics, where um, entropy is a thermodynamic variable. So we say Lux entropy condition is satisfied. if the following holds that is the derivative of the flux function with respect to u. So that what we call the characteristic speed. We called it a before, but we can write it then like that. So that must be larger than the shock speed, and that must be larger than the characteristic speed evaluated with ur. So that is, and that is satisfied, that, that is true, um, and that has to hold, holds for convex or concave, I'll give you that in a minute, uh, conservation law. That is then a conservation law of the kind that we saw in the beginning. The time derivative of a conserved variable and the space derivative of a flux function f is equal to zero. Um, where convex means that the second derivative of f with respect to u is greater than zero and concave means that the second derivative of u with, uh, of f with respect to u is smaller than zero. So you have either the one or the other. And that holds when a discontinuity is propagating with the speed s. When a discontinuity is propagating with speed s. then we have to check that. If we check that now for this expansion shock, <coughs> we would get that the f prime of u is u itself, because the f prime, the characteristic speed of, uh, for the universe Berkeley's equation, it's u itself. So f prime of u is u, because uh, remember we had the the f of u was u squared half for the universe Berkeley's equation and the f prime of u is then u. So, therefore, we have then f prime of ul is ul, and that is clearly smaller than the shock speed, because we would assume also that the shock speed is the arithmetic mean of the two, <coughs> which is then smaller than ur. So we would have the wrong sign here. We would have here smaller s, smaller, and that indicates that it, the entropy Lux entropy condition is not satisfied for an expansion shock. So Lux entropy condition not satisfied for an expansion shock. And that is well, indicating that it is not, not, a, not, a, not a true shock. But if you remember the shock that we had in the beginning, in the shock we had ul larger than u right. So if we have a shock, then we have here ul is larger than the arithmetic mean, 
of U L and U R, and that is larger than U right. So for a shock, the entropy condition is satisfied. So, so Lux entropy condition is satisfied. gives us then a chance to, to check that. And now I promised you to give you an argument for the shock speed. So we can now get rid of the expansion shock, but it will meet us again later on, because a very good numerical method actually for, the, for such scalar conservation laws, namely actually the uplink method, has a problem with this. But we'll come to that later. Now we want to identify the shock speed. How can we get that? Now we want really to get it for, for the true shock. So we get the shock speed S from what is called the rankin Bibonneau condition. rankin -Bibonneau. That is named after um, William John McCorn Rankin, a Scottish engineer, and Pierre Henri Hugonio, a French engineer, both in, from the 19th century. So they found out the following. And we can generalize that even for systems. It's not only true for scalar conservation law, the shock speed S times the jump in the conserved variables, that is ur minus ul, is equal to the jump in the flux. And that is f of ur minus f of ul. So, and that gives us then the shock speed. So in our case, we simply can divide this uh, flux jump by the jump in the conserved variable. So for the inviscid Burgess equation, we can easily check that. Also, if you have another conservation law, you can also do that. All you need is you need to compute this ratio of the jump, of the flux jump, and the jump of the conserved variable. So, for the inviscid Burgess equation, we have. equation we have the following it is 13 <coughs> then we write directly s what is s s is the f of ur minus f of ul and the f of ur is ur squared half that is our flux function f of ur because remember f of u is u squared half minus the ul squared half, which is the f of ul. So we have now computed this, this jump here, this flux jump for the inviscid Burgess equation. So now we divide by ur minus ul. And then we see by the third binomial formula that we can express this as UL plus UR half. <coughs> so then we have the, the shock speed for the inviscid version. And that is what I told you before, the arithmetic mean of U left and U right. So then we have the basic understanding of the inviscid Burgess equation. We have now the solution to the Riemann problem, both when UL is larger than UR and when UL is smaller than UR. So now we are going to use that for doing the discretization using the finite volume method.
before we do that, before we actually use this, what we learned about now for this Riemann problem, we look at a property that we would like to have. And first we look at, a, at an, ex, an example where this property is not uh, there, and what this means. And the property that we want to focus on now is called total variation diminishing methods. Total variation diminishing methods. is TBD that you will probably find in any CFD tool. So let us try to look at an example. method that we already saw for the linear flexion equation, which is the lux wendorf method. And that can be generalized also for, say in that case, for the application to uh, scalar conservation laws and with a discontinuous initial condition. Let us see what is then happening. Well, here we have the initial condition and what we see is a discontinuity at 0 0.2 solution jumps from the initial condition jumps from 2 uh, to let's see I think this is sorry I think this is not for the Ingus Burgess equation but I think it's just for scalar conservation law sorry for that but we have here a jump from 0 to 1 and here at 0.4 a jump from 1 to uh, 0 so, and I, have, I want to correct myself again, it is not for the Indus Burgess equation, but for linear action equation. But nevertheless, we will see some phenomenon that is typical for this method. So you see, it is propagating, and we get here some smearing, and here we get an overshoot. So we get above the solution that we had in the beginning. This is not acceptable, and here we have another problem. Here we see we get oscillations. So here we get something that goes be below the solution that we had in the beginning, above and below, so we have oscillations. And what happens is, by these oscillations, the total variation increases. We define it in a minute, but that is something that is not physical. Um, so this is an example of what happens, even with a good method, at a discontinuity. You see, on this side, we get oscillations. And that is then an example <coughs> when the total variation of the solution is increasing. So we can just note that uh, what we see here, that is um, an example of the Gibbs phenomenon. So let's see, um, Gibbs phenomenon. is oscillations oscillations at discontinuity in this example it was uh, by lux wendorf method which is otherwise a good method it's second order in space and time but it suffers from this skips phenomenon And what we have seen here is, in this example, we have x and we just look at one, discontinu one discontinuity 
Well, here it is, uh, this one. Okay, we can do it like that. So that was uh, the U. So here we had the initial condition was then um, we have our solution at a few, just a few points or a few cells actually. And um, let's see if we assume that we have the discontinuity sitting here. So we have in the, in, in the beginning we have uh, we have solution solutions here, and we have a jump. Right, extended a little bit. And then, so that would be the initial condition, u of x say zero, and then we would do some, uh, we would do some, that uh, would do some, um, so the initial condition then would be like that. And the dots mark then the numerical approximation in the cell centers. And then if we would do a few uh, time steps of the event, so we would then look at, uh, say, let's say, say the u, the u, j, n, it's, uh, after a few time steps, we would then get something, maybe this would have gone down, and this would have gone up, this gone down, and this would maybe also have uh, uh, gone up, and it's not... Well, yeah, we could have, we could have, we could have maybe something here, whatever. So that would be then the numerical solution. Okay. This would be the numerical solution here. If we would combine, connect the points by straight lines, as MATLAB would do, we would then get maybe something of that. And what has happened then is that the total variation has increased. So first we define the total variation. The total variation is defined as follows. It is 14. That is then in, of a numerical solution. For example, the, the red solution there. Then we do the sum actually over all indices. We assume that it's defined for all x, for all cells. Usually, you just need it for, if we have a periodic problem, just for the period that we consider, because then you can extend it everywhere. And then it sums the difference between the solution at, in the cell J and the neighbor, J minus 1. So this difference is simply summed. That is called the total value. <coughs> and in our case, what is the total variation of the initial condition? Here we have just zero, zero, zero. It is just this jump. This jump is the total variation of the initial condition. But for the numerical solution, we will get this. Will be get you get this in addition. We will get also a contribution from from this jump here. So we get a lot of jumps. We get. This jump here from here to here will add, this will add, this will add, will also add from here to here, from here to here. So the, the total variation of the red solution <coughs> is clearly larger than the total variation of the initial condition. So we have then here the TV of UN, in this example, is larger than the total variation of the initial condition, U0. And that is something that means we have violated the total variation. We could also do it for n minus 1, it would be a similar argument. And that is something that could not happen. For a true conservation law, this is something that cannot happen. We cannot have a, an increase of the total variation. What we must have is that the total variation does not increase. So that is the problem that we need, and that is then um, giving us a condition that is called TBD. Let me just give you that. So what we, and then we do the comparison um, from the new time step to the old time step. 
So, um, so we want methods. For which the total variation is not included. Because that is what it should. And that has motivated the following definition. We say a one-step method one-step method that is a method that we have seen so far, for example, the explicit or implicit Euler methods are methods where you just do one step. You are at time uh, Tn and you go one step to Tn plus one. That's it. If you have a two-step method like the BDF, you need also Tn minus one. That is a two-step method. But the one-step method is the most of what we have so far Discuss. So, a one-step method is called total variation diminishing and the acronym is TDB if the following is true that we take this condition 15, <coughs> that we say the total variation of the numerical solution at the new time level must be smaller equal than the total variation at the old time level. <coughs> and that is what we should have. But the name is a little bit misleading. The name says total variation diminishing. But you see, we have here not a smaller, but a smaller equal. It is completely okay to have, a, to have uh, an equal, so that the total variation does not change. So the, the correct name would have been total variation non-increasing, but that has not come like that. When Ami Harton developed this, he called it total variation diminishing. So then that method, that name has prevailed. So, but that is the property that we like. Of course, if we have this property, then something like that cannot happen. Okay, so then we stop here for 15 minutes break.